The Great Commission Ministries presents the center of repentance, the biblical concept of repentance. Introduction. Has anybody ever asked you, if you had your life to live over, what would you do differently? I've been asked that question, and I'm sure we've all been asked that question from time to time. And I never cease to be amazed when I hear people answer that question by saying, I wouldn't do anything different from how I lived my life. I simply can't imagine that. I can't believe that someone would think that if they had the opportunity to do everything they ever did over again, that there's nothing that they would change. It seems to me the statement I would do everything the same would be the quintessence of impenitence because we would say we don't regret anything that we've ever said or done. That's simply impossible, particularly when we acknowledge that we all are sinners and that we all have done things that are wrong, that we've offended God, and certainly if we are Christians, we would want to do those things over again rather than offend against God. Well, what we're going to be doing in this study, as we read through this study, is look at the biblical concept of repentance. We understand the idea of repentance is central, not only to the New Testament, but to all of Scripture. We recall that the New Testament opens with the appearance of John the Baptist, who comes out of the wilderness announcing the impending approach of the kingdom of God. And his message to the people of Israel is very simple. He announces these words, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then it's just a short time later, Jesus begins his public ministry, and when he begins to preach, his message is exactly the same. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Throughout the New Testament, when people listen to Christ or listen to the preaching of the apostles and they ask, what should we do? What should be our response at this time in history? The answer is always some form of the reply, believe on Christ or believe and be baptized or repent and be baptized. And so since that concept of repentance is so central to the biblical preaching, it's very important that we gain an understanding of what all is involved in it. Let's start by looking at the word itself. The word repentance comes to us from a Greek word that we find in the New Testament, which word is metanoia. And this is one of those words that has a prefix and a root. And the prefix meta is one that I think we're all familiar with because we hear it in the English language. Like we think of metaphysics, for example. The study of physics is the study of those elements of nature that are visible, that are perceivable, that are physical, and so on. And metaphysics is an attempt to reach beyond the realm of the physical world to the transcendent realm. And the prefix meta can mean with, beside, or after. Now the root, noia, is the verb of the noun that we find frequently in the Bible, the noun nous. And that's simply the Greek word for mind. And so in its simplest form, the term metanoia, the Greek word for repentance, has to do with the mind afterwards. We might think of an afterthought, and it came to mean in the Greek language, a significant changing of one's mind. One example where this is used is in 1 Corinthians 14, 15. We're reading from the New American Standard Bible. What is the outcome then? I pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. So in its most rudimentary sense, the concept of repentance in the Bible means to change one's mind. But if we look at it carefully, we will begin to see it's not just a matter of some kind of intellectual judgment where we're trying to solve a problem and that the first approach to one conclusion, but then after we give it the benefit of the second glance and we examine it further, we decide to change our conclusion and go with a different hypothesis or an educated guess. That's simply not the idea of metanoia. Metanoia has to do with, generally speaking, with the changing of one's mind with respect to one's behavior. And it carries with it the idea of 
ruining. When we rue something, that means that we regret that we have done a particular action. And the idea of ruining carries with it not only an intellectual assessment, but also some kind of an emotional or visceral response. You see, the feelings are involved. And so the feeling that is most often associated with repentance in the scriptures is the feeling of remorse, regret, a sense of sorrow and grief for having acted in a particular way which we would like to undo, which we would like to erase from the record if we could. So it involves a kind of sorrow for a previous form of behavior. Now, the idea of repentance is deeply rooted in Old Testament Israel. And when scholars examine this concept of repentance as it was played out in the Old Testament, sometimes makes the distinction between two kinds of repentance. And it's the first kind that we will look at initially. And the first kind of repentance that we will find in the Old Testament is called cultic or ritualistic repentance. And the second kind of repentance is called prophetic repentance. The first one is cultic or ritualistic repentance. Now, what does that mean? The word cultic can be very misleading to us at this point because when we use the term cult, we might think of something that's a little bit off-center, some group like Jonestown or David Koresh, and that is the group we think of is cult. And the cults are something we regard as being anything but orthodox. They're heretodox heretical groups that are involved in some kind of erroneous religious involvement. Heterodox means not conforming with accepted or orthodox standards or beliefs. But the term cultic, when we use it in a technical sense in theology, the study of God, refers not to cults as mentioned a moment ago, but it refers to the behavioral patterns or the religious life of a given community. And so we look at the Old Testament and we look at the nation of Israel, we speak of Israel's cultist or its community practice in terms of their religious observances. So there's no negative or pejorative association of the word cultic here. That is what happens in the organized religious life of Israel according to the commandments of God. God is the one who institutes the cultist of Israel. He defines by his law not only how the people are to behave morally, but he also gave specific directions for how they are to behave religiously, that is, how they are to pray, how they are to offer sacrifices, how the ministrations of the temple worship are to be carried out, and that's all part of the ritual or the cultic practices of the nation of Israel. Cultic or ritualistic repentance, a general or national fast. Now, when we look at that in the Old Testament, we see that there are certain practices that are integral to the ritualistic system and the cultic practices of the Jewish people. Now, we're specifically concerned with repentance. And the purpose of repentance in these observations and these rites and rituals was to call attention for the patterns that were to be followed when the people had sinned against God and provoked his wrath. Now, once God had become angry with the nation, then these people were called upon to do certain things in order to placate the wrath of God. That was the idea behind these ritualistic practices, to ameliorate, to satisfy God's anger, so that his anger would be turned aside, the people could be forgiven for their sins, and peace with God be restored to the community. Now, some of the things that were part of this procedure of the ritual of penitence or repentance in the Old Testament included the following items. First of all, there would be a call for a general and sometimes a national fast. If the people had sinned, the prophets might come, for example, and call the people to a solemn assembly. And then when the assembly was called and everybody was required to come, to this assembly, men, women, and children, the whole nation was brought forth before the tent of meeting in the wilderness and then later on at the temple. And the prophet would speak and announce God's judgment to the people and call for a general fast so that everyone 
would go without food for a particular period of time as a national sign of repentance in order that God may turn his wrath away from the people. Cultic or ritualistic repentance, rending of one's garments. The second element of this ritual that we find in the Old Testament involves particular articles of clothing that were designed to be a garb of mourning. And this particular kind of clothing was first associated specifically with the process of mourning. We remembered that when David's child took sick and was sick unto death, that David tore his clothes, he rent his garments. We read that expression, the renting of one's garments, and it doesn't mean that you sell them to somebody else on a lease program. Uh, to rent them means to tear them, to rip them apart. And we'll sometimes read these strange and bizarre descriptions of people who are grief-stricken in the Old Testament, that they express their grief by ripping off their clothes. And then to add to the tearing of the garments, the other part of the ritual that was then associated with repentance was not only the rending of garments, but the donning of sackcloth and ashes. And you read about these people going around with this coarse cloth on their bodies uh, that was most uncomfortable. It was a kind of punitive measure by which people were inflicting this discomfort upon themselves as a mark of their repentance. And so they would tear their clothes, put on sackcloth, and then take ashes. And they would either sit in an ash heap or take ashes and spread them on their clothes and then spread them across their forehead or their heads. All of these processes by way of ritual was a sign of self-abasement, the belittling or the humiliation of oneself. Again, you see it over and over again. What does Job say after God speaks to him in the whirlwind? He says, I abhor myself. This is Job's repentance. And he said, I repent in dust and ashes. And he adds on the sackcloth and so on. So that's all part of the tradition of Israel. Cultic or ritualistic repentance, the lament. Now, along with the change of clothes, which again, this change of clothing is designed to indicate symbolically a change of heart, a change of mind. Then the verbal element that would be associated with it would be a particular kind of song that was a kind of dirge in the Old Testament, which was the lament. And the lament was an expression of grief. And sometimes the lament would be used when somebody died or some catastrophe took place and people would sing the lament. We have a whole book in the Bible written by a man who is known as the Weeping Prophet. And his name was Jeremiah. And after the book of Jeremiah, we have the shorter book called the Book of Lamentations. And there Jeremiah is lamenting the destruction of Jerusalem, the result of God's judgment upon the nation, because they were impenitent. Well, true penitence was to be expressed with the lament, a song of grief and accompanied by loud cries and wailing. Notice in the New Testament, there are occasions where we would see Jesus raising people from the dead. And in one of those occasions, the funeral process, the cortege, the procession is already in process. And they have professional mourners. They were people who were paid to carry out these rites and rituals in the event of the death of a loved one. And so even though they didn't particularly or necessarily feel the pain of personal loss and grief, they were good actors, and they would wail and cry and carry on and beat their chest and add on the sackcloth and ashes to express this cultic form of lament. Well, again, the same kind of activity was associated with the ritual of repentance, so that when a person was expressing sorrow before God for having sinned against him, he would be engaged in the general fast he would change the clothes, add on the sackcloth and ashes. He would express the lament and with that having cries and groans and wailing. Now we see also specific prayers that become part of the religious system of Israel. If we go to the hymnal of the Old Testament, it's the book of Psalms, where we have prayers and poetry put to music that was sung as part of the liturgy of the Israelite community. And we divide the Psalms into different groups. There are psalms of imprecation, 
there are ascension psalms, there are coordination psalms, there's all these different kinds of psalms, psalms that are panegyric to celebrate the goodness of God's law. But one of the sections of the psalms, or one of the types of psalms that we designate, are called the penitential psalm, the most famous of which is Psalms 51, the psalm David wrote after Nathan the prophet confronted him with his sin with Bathsheba, and he confesses his sin and prays for the forgiveness of God. That's not the only penitential psalm. There are several such penitential psalms, and they all include an acknowledgement of sin against God, a resolve to turn away from the evil behavior, and a plea before God in humility that God would restore the people to a state of grace. And so that's all part of the religious life. And one of the last features of this is that periodically in the Jewish church year, as it were, there would be specific days that were designed not only for feasts and celebrations and remembrances of the past, but there would be particular days that were set apart to be days of penitence. Days that there would be a corporate expression and acknowledgement of sin and sorrow for that sin. All of these things, as I say, are part of the cultic life of Israel. Now, the second kind of repentance, which we'll talk about next with greater extent, is called prophetic repentance, where here the prophets did not despise the rituals that God had ordained that the people use to express themselves when they were sorry for their behavior, but prophetic repentance was a judgment upon Israel for the cultic practices when it degenerated into a mere externalism, where people just went through the motions of repentance, but their repentance lacked in real sincerity. And so in the age of the great prophets in the 8th and 9th century BC, the prophets there emphasized the need for godly sorrow that is genuine, that it comes from the heart, and we'll look at that kind of repentance next. In the Old Testament, we've seen that there were certain practices and rituals that God instituted for His nation Israel, by which people could express, verbalize, and demonstrate their sorrow for sin. Let me ask you, how do you do that? How do you show a broken heart for having offended God? How do we demonstrate it in the life of the church? In the Roman Catholic system, we have a whole system of penitence that is tied into the sacraments of the church. And for the Protestants, there's very little that is now a part of the ritual of the church. And sometimes on Sunday, we have a prayer that we read that is a corporate confession of sin, or the sinner's prayer, followed by the assurance of pardon by the minister. But it seems we have lost our way in terms of having some prescribed method of showing and having a genuine godly repentance. And I think we suffer the consequences of that because in a word, we don't know how to demonstrate godly repentance. And of course, the main thing is that we have it and that it comes from the heart, but it also helps when we can find ways to demonstrate our change of heart and our change of mind before God. It's a wonder how God works with the power of His Word, and when the words are taken from the Scripture and put into the context of the song, and you hear it, and it begins to percolate in your soul and in your mind, and you don't really get it out of your bloodstream. There's an old gospel hymn, and it goes, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. For He will have mercy for He will have mercy, for He will have mercy, and abundantly pardon. And of course, these words were taken right from the Scriptures, from the words of the prophets, who were concerned profoundly that true repentance be a part of the life of the people of God. Now, we've looked already in the subject of repentance at the rituals that the Jewish people followed in the Old Testament, the cultic practices, and the appointed day of fasting and the day of repentance and the changing of clothes and the wailing and the laments were all part of this process. But particularly, I mentioned the prophets of the 8th and 7th century. People like Amos and Hosea would come to the people as did Jeremiah and Isaiah as well and remind them 
that the kind of repentance that God demands is a repentance that comes from the heart. And the bottom line was this, rend your hearts and not your garments. Prophetic Repentance Regarding practice of the rending of garments, it wasn't intended for you just to tear your clothes as a sign of repentance, but it was to symbolize what has taken place on the inside. Now, when the prophets said that they were not opposed to the practice of rending of garments, the point was, it was not enough to tear your clothes as a sign of repentance. The heart must be torn. We must feel this rupture of our soul when we realize that we have offended God. Now, to get a better handle on this prophetic approach to repentance, I want to turn your attention to one of the books of the Minor Prophets that focuses on the relationship between the rituals of repentance and the reality that those rituals are designed to symbolize, and that's the book of the prophet Joel. Let's see how the book begins. In the first chapter, we read the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Petiel. Hear this, you elders, and give ear all you inhabitants of the land. You see, as most of the prophets did when they announced the oracle that God had given them, is that they would call for a solemn assembly, call the people together to hear this announcement that comes from God. Has anything like this happened in your days? Or even the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. He's talking about the devastation of judgment that has affected the land. We read this. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. What's the deal with these bugs? The chewing locust eats the leaf. The swarming locust eats the tree or the bark. The crawling locust goes down and eats the root. When these three attack, nothing is left. And this is horrifying. So judgment upon judgment has now afflicted the people of God. And so the land has been devastated by drought and by the invasion of insects that destroy the crops of the people. And all of this is seen and perceived by the prophets as the hand of God's judgment on the people for their sin. And so now comes the call to turn, to change their mind. We pick up from verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth, and even the crops of the vineyards had been destroyed and that those lying around in a drunken stupor need to wake up and see that even the pleasure that they have received from the fruit of the vine has dried up. Now, it's time, Joel says, to these people to wail and to weep, again calling attention to the cultic signs of repentance. The definition of to wail means to have a prolonged high-pitched cry of pain, grief, or anger. Then he goes on to say in verse 8, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The picture painted in this verse is as if a virgin bride is walking into her husband's funeral, as if the bride was to walk in wearing a sackcloth instead of a wedding dress, and in mourning. What an image. Think about this. In a woman's whole life, there's probably no time where more care is given to the selection of a dress than in the selection of her bridal gown. And the woman only wears it once. And then they carefully seal it up in plastic and stick it up in the attic and hope the moths won't get to it. But everybody waits for the moment when the father and the mother of the bride stands next to her and you hear the bridal march, here comes the bride. And everybody turns to watch the procession of the bride. And always there's these spontaneous oohs and ahs as we see the woman dressed in the finest gown she'll ever wear. Well, here's what the prophet says. That Israel is like a bride who is dressed in sackcloth. Imagine going to a wedding where the bride enters wearing a burlap bag. 
over her body. You just can't imagine that. But that's the image that's used here by the prophet Joel to show how repentance is supposed to be demonstrated. And then he says in the second part of verse 9, The priest mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns. The grain is in ruin. The new wine is dried up and the oil fails. Now, if you know anything about the economy of ancient Israel, you know that it was an agricultural society that was based itself principally on the growing and the sale of wheat and wheat products, of the fruit of the vine, the grapes in the wine that came from that. But most important to the economy was the oil industry, taken from the olive trees. And you've heard of the Mount of Olives, the presses that were used to squeeze the olives to gain their oil. And many functions were developed for the use of this oil. So what the prophet is saying is all of the industry, the whole national economy of Israel is now bankrupt. Everything has dried up. Be ashamed, you farmers. Wail, you vine dressers. Wail for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field has perished, and so on, and joy has withered away. Now, verse 13, we see again the instructions for showing repentance. Gird yourselves and lament, you priest. Wail, you who minister before the altar. Come and lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. Notice there's a call of repentance to the farmers, there's a call of repentance that goes to the people in general. But the weightiest call in this time of national calamity, the weightiest call for penance is to the clergy, to the priest, to the ministers of the people. They are the ones who have the burden of the national guilt. It's been said of the prophets of Israel that the prophets of Israel functioned as the nation's conscience. And particularly difficult for the prophets was their task of calling the priest of the land to repentance. Because as the priest became corrupt, then true godliness was concealed from the people. And instead of training the people in godliness and training the people in the truth of God, the false prophets and the corrupt priest left their primary vocation. Instead of ministering to the people, they were trying to please the people. Instead of exhorting the people, they complimented the people. Instead of calling the people to repentance when they sinned, rather offend the people or risk their alienation and their wrath, the priests became involved in collusion with them and made the people feel good. It was a feel-good type of religion. And so the prophet comes with the word of God on his lips and he says to the ministers, Wail! and howl, and cry, and lie down in sackcloth and ashes. And then verse 14, Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry out for the Lord. All of these are elements of the rituals of repentance that we find in the Old Testament. Now, if we move later on in the text, we read these words in the second chapter of Joel, starting at verse 12. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. The element that is central to the prophetic concept of repentance in the Old Testament can be captured in this one word, a word that we hear frequently in the jargon that Christians use today. The focal point of the prophetic call to repentance may be seen in this one word, conversion. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
We often speak of my conversion to the Christian faith. Nobody is born naturally a Christian. In order to become a Christian, something has to happen by which we are changed, by which we are turned around. And that's linked to the biblical concept of metanoia. The change of mind is something that is, as I said, not simply an intellectual adjustment of a concept, but it involves the changing and turning around of one's entire life. For the prophet, repentance is not simply a ritual that we do in church. For the prophet, repentance is integral to vital conversion of the soul. It means a change of one's entire being, and it refers to a kind of turn. In everybody's life, there is a turning point. I might ask you, what is the turning point of your life? And you may think about, well, I met certain person that changed my life forever. Or the turning point of my life is when I got that big job. Or that turning point of my life was a disaster or calamity that took place and so on. And we look at those crucial moments that define our existence. But for the Jew, for the prophet of Israel, the supreme turning point in one's life was the turning point of conversion. And it is a turn, and it's also seen in the Old Testament as a return. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Now, not just a turn to the Lord, but remember, in Israel it was God who was the founder of the nation. It was God who started these people in their identity as his chosen people. And he entered into a covenant with them. And he gave them certain precepts that they would follow. And the people swore a vow that they would follow after God. And that they would obey his commandments. And that they would love him with all their hearts. But the nation then turned away. And so the prophets came to the nation and said, You have to turn around and return to the Lord. Now, this can be a little misleading because I mentioned a moment ago that none of us starts with God in terms of a redemptive experience. By nature, we're at enmity with God and so on. We may more properly speak about turning from the life we're living now and turning to God. But originally, in creation, in Adam, there was a time when the whole race was incorporated in our federal head, Adam, who enjoyed obedience before God, and perfect fellowship with God. Milton wrote in his epic work, Paradise Lost. And we lost paradise when we turned away from God and turned each person to their own way, and so on. And so, now when we call people to conversion, it's appropriate to say, it's time to go home. It's time to go back to where we were originally, in the presence of God, in fellowship with God in submission to God. And so the call to repentance from the lips of the prophet is a call to return, to go back home. And so the most important turning point in my life was my conversion. There's no other event in my life that had such a radical impact on everything that followed from it. My whole life was changed, turned upside down, Now, I wasn't made perfect. No, we don't rid ourselves of sin overnight. But metanoia, the changing of the mind, the conversion means that before the point of conversion, your life was moving in a specific direction. And that direction is away from God. And the longer we live in impenitence, non-repentance, and the longer we remain in an unconverted state, the further we move away from God. And what happens at conversion isn't that we don't jump from sin to perfection instantly, but our lives are turned around. And from the moment of our conversion, our lives are moving in a different direction, back to the presence of God. But why is it called repentance? 
Because this turning point is not just a turning to something, it's a turning from something. And it's that element that we'll look at next. I'd like you to think back today over your life. And if you have the time and inclination in your place where you can do this comfortably, take out a pencil or a pen, a little notepad, and write a list of the most crucial turning points of your life. What are those moments? What are those decisions? What are those events that turned you away from God? We use the expression properly, I was turned off to God. Or what are those moments in your life that are the turning points in terms of changing you for the better? Let me ask you this question to ask yourself. Are you a converted person? Where are you headed? What direction are you moving? If you remember the story of Alice in Wonderland, when she came to the fork of the road and she was lost, and there was a cat sitting in the tree. And in her confusion, she looks up at the cat and she said, I don't know where to go. Which road should I take? And the cat smiled at her and said, That depends. And she said, Depends on what? And then he said, Where are you going? And then she said, I don't know. And what the cat say? Then it doesn't matter. And that's my question for you. Where are you going? What direction are you moving? Does your life need to turn? The Model Prayer for Repentance As we continue our examination of the biblical concept of repentance, we understand that the concept of repentance is not something that's simply tangential to the New Testament, but it's at the very heart of the whole plan of redemption. Now, sometimes we look at it as a kind of add-on or tack-on to faith. We say that justification is by faith alone, and because of that, we have a tendency to think that repentance may or may not be involved in this. But what I hope we will see in this chapter is that conversion and justification in the scriptures always includes and involves repentance. Now, we've already looked at how repentance develops in the Old Testament. First, in terms of the religious expressions of it, by way of ritual and so on. And second of all, by way of prophetic repentance. And now what I want to do is look closely at the model prayer of repentance that we find in the Psalms, and of course, which is Psalms 51. I mentioned already that several of the Psalms are placed under the heading of penitential Psalms, but the supreme example of repentance is found in Psalms 51, which was written by David after he had been confronted by the prophet Nathan, and Nathan had declared to David, Thou art the man. Now, what's important for us as we look at this is not simply to get in touch with the personal anguish that was being expressed by David, his profound sense of heartfelt remorse, but we're understanding here that repentance is something that is brought about in the human heart by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And so, here is a repented person who is being repentant because of the influence of the Holy Spirit upon him. But not only that, as he writes this prayer, he's writing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So in a sense, it's the Holy Spirit instructing us on what the Holy Spirit yields in us when he works the work of repentance in our hearts. So keep that in mind as we look at the Psalms. It begins with these words. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Now, we see an element here that's fundamental to repentance. When a person comes to the place where they are aware of their sin and are turning from their sin, characteristically, what they do is they throw themselves on the mercy of God. 
That's the first fruit of authentic repentance. Is that you recognize that the only way you can hope to stand before God, once you have acknowledged your guilt, is if God will deal with you by virtue of His mercy. David does not ask God for justice, because he knows that if God deals with him according to His justice, David will be destroyed. And so he confesses his sin before God and begins the psalm with begging, with pleading, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Now there's a powerful image, a metaphor there. We see it with Shakespeare. Remember with Lady Macbeth, when she had the bloodstains on her hands, and she tried everything she can to remove the physical evidence of her crime, but there was no soap strong enough to remove that stain of blood from her hands. And she cries out in anguish. Remember that line? Out, out, damn spot. Yet she can't get rid of it. And yet, this image of being made clean is at the heart of the biblical concept of forgiveness. And David pleads with God to blot out his transgressions. He's asking that God will remove the stain from his soul. That God will cover his unrighteousness and cleanse him from the sin that is now a permanent part of his life. And so he says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, that's important. That in the sense of conversion, that is the result of repentance, is that what the penitent person is asking for is not only forgiveness, but cleansing. They're not the same thing. We understand in the New Testament, where John tells us that if anyone sins, that we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. And he says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1.9 So, when we are in a spirit of repentance, we go before God and we confess our sin, we despise our sin, we ask for the pardon of our sin, but not only for pardon, but for the strength to refrain from doing that sin anymore. So, we ask that the part of our spirit that has inclined us to wickedness may be made clean. And that's the cry here in the psalm. Well, David continues, and in verse 3 he says, For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Wow, this is serious business here. See, in his repentance... This isn't just a casual acknowledgement of guilt. Here's a haunted man, and he's saying, I know I'm guilty. There's no attempt to minimize my guilt. There's no attempt of self-justification. You see, we are masters of rationalization. We are quick to excuse ourselves and give all kinds of reasons for our sinful behavior. Until we are brought to the point in our souls by the Holy Spirit where we have to be honest before God and say, Hey, wait a minute. I'm a guilty man. And I know I'm a guilty man. And I'm not going to try and minimize that guilt. And my sin is ever before me. I can't get rid of it. It's hounding me. So, he's a haunted man. Every time he closes his eyes, he sees his own guilt in his mind's eye. And then he cries out, Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. David, in a sense, is using hyperbole here when he says that it is against thee and thee only that he has sinned. Because he has sinned against Bathsheba, he sinned against Uriah, he sinned against his wife, he sinned against the whole nation. But David understands that ultimately sin is an offense against God. Because God is the only perfect being in the universe. He is the judge of heaven and earth. And all sin 
is defined in terms of a transgression of God's law and an offense against his holiness. And so David acknowledges that. He's not minimizing the reality. He's not minimizing the reality of the sin against human beings and against creatures. But now he's standing naked, as it were, before God and saying, God, against you, ultimately, that I have sinned and committed this transgression. And then he makes a statement here that's often overlooked. It's found in the second part of verse 4. But I think it's one of the most powerful expressions of true repentance that we could find in the scriptures. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Paul quotes this in Romans. And what David is saying is this. O oh God, you have every right to judge me. And it's clear that I deserve nothing more than your judgment and wrath. That's part of repentance. That's part of acknowledging. It's one thing to beg for forgiveness. It's another thing to demand forgiveness, to presume upon forgiveness, and forget that God has every right to exercise His justice instead of His mercy upon us. And David knows that. And David said, God, that you may be blameless when you speak and clear when you judge. You have every right to throw the book at me. And he knows it. And he acknowledges it. And so there's no bargaining here. Negotiating with God. For behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin my mother conceived me. And behold, you desired truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. You will find that in the doctrine of truth, what God wants from us is not just truth externally, but He wants truth that comes from the very center of our being. And David is saying, I know what you want, and what you want I haven't given. What you have commanded I have not done. What I'm obligated to pay I haven't paid. What you want, O oh God, is a true righteousness. You don't just want external ceremonies. You want it inside of me. You want it to flow from the center of my being. You want truth in my inward parts, and I haven't given it. And then he cries out again for cleansing. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Again, there is a certain note of utter dependence upon God, utter helplessness. David doesn't say, God, wait a minute. Before I continue this dialogue and prayer, I have to go clean my hands. I have to go get washed. Because David knows that he's incapable of removing this stain of guilt from himself. He cannot make up for it. We cannot atone for our own sins. And David says, The only way I can be clean is if you purge me, if you wash me. But the good news is, O oh God, if you wash me, I will be clean. I will be whiter than snow. This was the promise of God that he gave later through the pen of the prophet Isaiah. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. As others be as crimson, they shall be as wool. Come, God says, let us reason together. Isaiah 1.18 And in that invitation, God is saying, I alone can make you clean, but I can make you clean. And God is pleased to clean us up when He finds us. In the dirt. Make me hear joy and gladness. Repentance is a painful thing. Who really enjoys going through the confession of sin and the acknowledgement of guilt? Guilt is the most powerful destroyer of joy there is.
And so David is not very happy at this moment. But he asked God to restore his soul. And in that restoration, to make him feel joy and gladness again. He uses this theme more than once in this passage. That the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Isn't that an interesting phrase? He says, God, you've crushed me. My bones are broken. And it wasn't Satan that broke my bones. And it wasn't Nathan that broke my bones. You broke my bones when you convicted me of my guilt. And so I'm standing here before you as a broken man. And the only way I can go on is if you heal me and give me the joy and gladness back. This type of language could only be understood between a shepherd and another shepherd. You see, David approached God knowing that God is a shepherd. And because David could have relate to God in this way, from a shepherd's heart to a shepherd's heart, knowing that in order to get his joy back, he would first need to be broken. Remember, David was the shepherd boy that became the king. And the Lord said that David was a man after his own heart. So David understood this process. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. There's that image of blotting out again. He says, God, don't look at my sin. Hide your face, not from me, but hide your face from my sin. And then he says again, create in me a clean heart. O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Again, the only way I can have a clean heart is by a work of divine creation. I am incapable of creating that in myself. Only God can create a clean heart. But God can create a clean heart. And He does create clean hearts. And He does it for David. And He says... Do not cast me away from your presence. This is the worst thing that could happen to David and to any sinner. And this is the thing that the impenitent person fails to realize. That if we persist in our impenitence, a lifestyle of non-repentance, God will in fact cast us out of his presence. We read in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness." You see, carnal Christians, the impenitent, non-repentant, have no promise of forgiveness and therefore cannot have faith. One example is the good thief was repentant and the bad thief was impenitent, non-repentant, as he mocked God. Furthermore, the impenitent thief is a character described in the New Testament account of the crucifixion of Jesus. The impenitent thief is sometimes referred to as the bad thief in contrast to the good thief. And so David is saying, hey, you've brought judgment to my family. You've brought judgment to my household. You've brought judgment to my nation. But whatever you do, O God, please do not leave me. Don't drive me out of your presence. As Jesus warned the people then that in the final day, he will say to those who are impenitent, depart from me, leave me, I do not know you. Don't cast me out of your presence, O God, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, the interesting thing about this is that this is a prayer of repentance of a believer. This is not the initial conversion of a man. This is the man who's already been converted, who has fallen into serious sin. And we continue. Restore to me 
the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. And then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. You know, we hear often that the people don't like to be in the presence of Christians because some Christians manifest a smug, self-righteous attitude, a goody-two-shoes, holier-than-thou kind of attitude. And what David is saying is, I'm happy to go teach transgressors your way. But I can't do that until I myself am restored. And as I have the joy of my salvation, and I understand that I am a forgiven person. As one preacher said it, all that goes into evangelism really is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. You see, it's not the righteous trying to correct the unrighteous. The chief difference between a believer and the unbeliever is forgiveness. And the only thing that qualifies a person to be a minister in the name of Christ is that that person has experienced forgiveness and he wants to communicate that to others. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, David says, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. And here's where we find the heart and soul of what we are calling prophetic repentance. For you do not desire sacrifice, else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings, but the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. The true nature of godly repentance is found in that phrase, A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. If I could atone for my own sin by bringing offerings or making a donation to church or trying to amend my ways in my own strength, if that would do it, I would do those things. But I know those things can't accomplish what I'm looking for. My only hope, O oh God, is not that you would despise me, but that you would be kind to me according to the mercy and according to your tender kindness. And the Bible tells us again and again, as James tells us that, God resists the proud, and He gives grace to the humble. James 4, 6 And David is confident at this point, that as broken as he is, he knows God, and he knows how God relates to the penitent people. He understands that God never hates or despises a broken and contrite heart. That's what God desires from us. That's what Jesus has in mind in the Beatitudes when he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that doesn't just simply apply to the grief that we experience with the loss of a loved one, but it also applies to the grief that we experience when we are stricken with guilt and when we come before God and beg his forgiveness then Jesus says to the person who mourns for those people who mourn over their sin the same Holy Spirit who brings us to that place of mourning is also the comforter who comes and restores to us the joy of our salvation it wouldn't hurt to memorize Psalms 51 God bless you